Well, I was encouraged uh, today already by the fact that we had someone visiting with us today that came as a result of watching our services online. And uh, so wanted to see what it was like in person. So that was uh, a great encouragement. I hope that we'll see more of that. Hey, if you're listening in and you've never visited Bethel, no better time than now. We'd love to have you. Love to meet you in person as well. And uh, rejoice in the Lord with, together with you. We're finishing up the book of Genesis. We've been doing Genesis for quite a few months now. We're in chapter 50, and we looked at it this morning, the 50th chapter. I want to focus in on just one verse. Let me remind you of a few things. You know, Joseph spent uh, much of his 20s in an Egyptian dungeon. He was separated from his father, who he loved dearly, and his father loved him especially, and never knew when or if he would see his father again. He passed through a lot of trials and he did so successfully because he never lost trust in God's purposes in his life or for his life that were revealed to him by God in a dream. He never lost trust in God's purposes for his life nor of God's goodness in his life. If you've ever had an eye test, and I think everyone in here probably has at one time or another, if you have 20-20 vision, that's considered perfect, right? Perfect vision. I want to change that today. I want to say that all of us need 50-20 vision. 50-20 vision. You know why? because the viewpoint that Joseph himself expresses in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20 is the kind of viewpoint, the kind of perspective that every Christian must live with. 50-20 vision. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 50 and uh, this is actually one of our memory verses we memorize verse 20 and 21, but let's uh, either say it or read it together. Verse 20, let's, let's go. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. 50, 20. Genesis 50, verse 20. That's the kind of viewpoint that every believer must adapt. Let's take a moment, look to the Lord in prayer, and then just uh, look a little more deeply at this uh, verse and the thoughts that Joseph expresses here. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you once again that we can open the Bible together because it's our very lifeline. It is the nourishment that we need for our soul. And I pray today that you would use this uh, passage, this text, to minister deeply to every one of us and that we, as a result, would have our thinking transformed by it, that our minds would be renewed that uh, there would be that renewing of our minds that would result in transformed living. Thank you for this truth. It's a gem in the book of Genesis. And it's born out in the lives of your people to this very day. And I thank you for it. And pray that we would get it. That it would register that we would see it and that we would believe it and that we would apply it in our lives. It'll make all the difference and it'll be glorifying to you. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. I want you to see basically two main things in Genesis 50 verse 20. First of all, I want you to see circumstances and that is caught up in that phrase, ye thought evil against me. 
ye thought evil against me. That is all, that covers all the circumstances in Joseph's life. And then, secondly, I want you to see providences, circumstances, and then providences. Providences are in that phrase, but God meant it unto good. And that simply means that God has the ability to take all of our circumstances, the ones that are meant by evil people to bring evil to our life, he can take all of those and he can use everything to accomplish his purpose in our lives. So circumstances and providences. Listen, honestly, I'm not trying to uh, be dramatic or over, uh, overly emphatic. If you understand the simple truth of circumstances and providences that are in this passage, you can live the Christian life victoriously successfully and so tune in and stay with me let's look first of all at the first part there that re that covers circumstances you thought evil against me 50 20 vision begins when you see God as sovereign over everything as sovereign over all your circumstances as sovereign over everything that life hands to you. Even the evil things that people do to you or say about you. Shall I repeat that? 50-20 vision is you recognizing that God is sovereign over everything that life hands to you. Even the evil things that others do to you or say about you. Now, think about that in the context of Joseph's life. There are major events of evil that take place in Joseph's life. Joseph's case is, well, he grew up in an abusive family. Have you come from an abusive home? domestic abuse. Perhaps some family member has abused you. Possible. Mentally. Or physically. Emotionally. Maybe even sexually. Often it is a family member that abuses that way. Joseph was abused in his own home you would think he would be an angry young man, wouldn't you? You would think that he would be angry at the world. You would think that he would be involved in all kinds of law breaking and he would be behind bars for it because of the abuse that he suffered in his own home by his own family members who abused him. No. Joseph knew and Joseph believed God had a purpose and a plan and he was trusting God to carry that all out in his life. He believed and he trusted that God had a plan for him and he was trusting God to carry out that purpose, that plan in his life. He trusted that God was not uh, just going to allow him to endure that. By the way, whatever God allows into your life, if it's evil, it's okay to deal with it the way it's meant to be dealt with. It doesn't have to be hidden. It doesn't have to just be held in. God doesn't mean for you to just passively endure the abuse that uh, you may be suffering or have suffered. It's okay to take proper action to deal with it. But ultimately, you have to believe that a sovereign God is in control of even the abuse. Think about Job for a moment. Pass, put uh, Joseph aside and think about Job. When you read the first chapter of Job, I mean, if you think about it, Aren't you shocked 
Because really, here is a man that uh, we read about that is a good man. He has seven boys. He has three daughters, ten children in all. He is very wealthy in his day. He had 7,000 sheep. He had 3,000 camels. He had 500 teams of oxen. He had uh, donkeys, I think 700 uh, uh, female donkeys, something like that, 500. And he also had a lot of hired servants. He's a very wealthy man. In a matter of minutes, listen to me, this is true. In a matter of minutes, I don't know if it was even in an hour's time, maybe in a half an hour. In a matter of minutes, his oxen and his donkeys and his farmhands are gone. In a matter of minutes, his sheep and his shepherds are all gone. In minutes, his camels and his servants are gone. And to top it all off, in that same time frame, in a matter of minutes, his children and their house is gone. All within the space of several minutes. Major events. Major events in Job's life, major events in Joseph's life. We have to believe in these circumstances, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. In other words, God is sovereignly over everything that life hands to you, even the evil things that happen to you or that people do to you. Major events, but that's not where it ends. I said everything. God is over everything. Not only the major events, but the minor happenings as well. You see, Joseph also realized that God was... God was sovereignly in control of the seemingly insignificant things in his life. For instance, his father told him to check up and see how his brothers were getting along if they needed anything. And so he can't find them, but he happens to run into a guy who knew where his brothers were. Isn't that interesting? kind of insignificant. He happens to run into this guy that knew exactly where his brothers were and when he gets there there happens to be a caravan that came by just when Reuben was going to set uh, Joseph free from being in that pit. It's not bad luck but Joseph sees a sovereign God sent him ahead. Listen to how he talks to his brothers in chapter 45, uh, beginning in verse 5. Now therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and the Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. The mundane things of our daily life. God is in control of those circumstances, those minor happenings. For example, the car problem when the battery's dead or the traffic jam that you're stuck in trying to get home after a long hard work day or the interruptions in your busy schedule when you got to get things done or the clogged drain uh, in your bathroom sink or your sick family members that seem to be not getting better but getting worse or a number of frustrating circumstances that uh, you face or whatever the bad things that other people say about you or even do to you it's all permitted by God into your life I read a preacher who said the devil couldn't have touched one single hair on Job's camel without God's permission circumstances the major events or the minor happenings 
Ye thought evil against me, he says to his brothers. 50-20 vision begins by recognizing that God is sovereign over everything that life hands to you, even the evil things that people do to you. Do you understand that? Do we get that? That's point number one. Circumstances. But thankfully it doesn't end with that. It doesn't end there. Second point, providences. But God meant it unto good. 50-20 vision continues. 50-20 vision is not only recognizing that God is sovereign over everything that life hands to you, even the evil things that people do to you, but 50-20 vision also realizes and recognizes that God sovereignly uses everything that touches you to accomplish his purpose in you so that he can accomplish his purposes through you. He can't accomplish anything through you until, first of all, he accomplishes what is needful in you. So instead of complaining, we ought to really thank God because he is making us more and more useful through his providences. God sovereignly uses everything that touches you to accomplish his purpose in you and through you. You have to believe that God is good. Ye, me, ye, ye, how does he say that in verse 20 again? Yeah. You thought, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. You have to believe that God is good. And he means everything that he allows into your life, even the bad things that people do to you or say about you, he means it for good. You say, how can good come out of it? Don't worry about that right now. Just believe that he means it unto good. You must believe that in all that God allows into your life, God always is only good. 50-20 of Genesis is paralleled by 8-28 of Romans. 50-20 of Genesis is the Romans 8-28 of the Old Testament of the Tanakh. It really is. And we know, Romans 8-28, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to to his purpose. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. He says, you, you know the thoughts that I have for you. Thoughts of peace and a good end. That's God's thoughts. Listen to this. This is uh, the psalmist in Psalm 119. And I love these verses as well. Verse 67. The psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I kept thy word. He says in the next verse, thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statute. He says in verse 75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hath afflicted me. God is always only good. It's difficult to recognize that when you're in the battle or when you're in the trial, when the heat's turned up, when you're, when you're in that crucible of suffering. It's difficult to recognize it, but you've got to believe it. He's good. Elizabeth Elliot, whose first husband was assassinated, murdered, uh, martyred, by those savage tribesmen that he and his partners were trying to reach with the gospel. Married again later on, and her second husband died of cancer. Here's what she wrote. Quote, The experiences of my life 
are not such that I could infer from them that God is good, gracious, and merciful necessarily. To have had one husband murdered and another to disintegrate body, soul, and spirit through cancer is not what you'd call proof of the love of God. In fact, there are many times when it looks like just the opposite. My belief in the love of God is not by inference or instinct. It is by faith. Spoken by a woman who's now with the Lord, but a woman that had standing to say something like this. It may not look like God's being good to you or to your family, but he is it didn't look that way in Joseph's life. It didn't look that way in Job's life. But look at how it ended up. You must look at your circumstances through providences, and you must see that God is sovereign over everything that touches your life to use it to create his purpose in you so he can carry out his purposes through you. In 1895, Andrew Murray, who was a South African pastor, was in England because he was suffering from a terrible, uh, terribly painful back that was the result of an injury that had happened years before. And one morning, while he was yet in his room eating his breakfast, the hostess where he was staying uh, told him of a woman that was downstairs that was in great trouble and wanted to know if Murray had any advice that she could give to, the, to this woman for him. And Murray instantly handed over a piece of paper that he had been writing on, and he said, uh, just give her this advice. Uh, I'm writing it down for myself. It may be that she'll find it helpful too. This is what it, he had written. I'm quoting. In time of trouble, say, first, he brought me here. It is by his will that I'm in this tight place. In that I'll rest. Next, he'll keep me here in his love and give me grace in this trial to behave as his child. Then, say, he'll make the trial blessing and he'll teach me lessons he intends me to learn and work in me the grace he means to bestow. And last, say, in his good time, he can bring me out again. How and when, he knows. Therefore, say, I am here by God's appointment, in his keeping, under his training, for his time. It's great advice. Believe God's good. Only, always, all the time. Secondly, you must avail yourself of God's grace. You must take his grace. And there are two steps, I think. There are two steps to be taken that will enable you to trust God's sovereign goodness in everything. Number one, enlightenment enlightenment and what I mean is trusting God is a mindset it is a God centered way of thinking and only by regularly renewing your mind through the shining of the Holy Spirit of his Bible truth in your heart can you be enlightened to trust him for example the book of 2nd Corinthians in the first chapter, Paul says something like this. He says, you know what? He said, God has given me more than I can handle. God has deliberately piled more on my plate than I can take. He said, in fact, I and my teammates, we've despaired of death. We feel like we're not going to make it. We're going to die. And then he tells us why God did that. Why does God give us more than we can handle? That we would learn not to trust in the Lord, uh, that we would learn rather not to trust in ourselves, but in the Lord that raises the dead. 
raises the dead? That we would trust resurrection power. That we would experience the supernatural, miraculous power of God. He piles it on. He lets more and more fall on us. He lets it uh, not uh, just rain, but pour, so that we are beyond our own strength, that we might experience his resurrection power and life in us. That's enlightenment that the Holy Spirit gives us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Read on in that book in chapter 4. And verses 10 and 11, he has just talked in the 8th and ninth verse about how he has just pressed so hard, but he's not in despair. He's crushed, but not, uh, not giving up. And then he says this. He says, this all happens because when I die, Christ's life exudes out of me. Through my death, through my life being squeezed out of my natural life being squeezed out of me, God's life is then able to flow through me. Jesus is manifest. His life, his person and life is manifest. But my life is cut. Get it? It's a death, not just physical, but a death to self that Christ might be seen. Grace involves enlightenment. You have to understand what's going on here, what the Holy Spirit says about why, what's going on here. Uh, get enlightenment from the Scripture. Let the Holy Spirit of God, the author of the book, shine His light in your heart as you open the Word of God and you get hope there. In order to have grace, you first of all have to have the enlightenment. you got to know what the provision is and uh, what it involves. Secondly, you got to take the enablement. You have to have enlightenment that leads you to take the enablement. It is only by a personal choosing to take the provision of grace, that spiritual ability, that spiritual strength that you need at that moment. Only by taking that provision, that, uh, that uh, grace, will you be able to trust God's sovereign goodness in everything. If you don't take that grace, you're going to doubt that he's good in your circumstances. Guarantee it. Because that's what the devil wants you to believe. The devil wants to place doubts in our minds of God's goodness. And he is a master at that. When the heat gets turned up, he says, see, God doesn't care about you. God doesn't answer your prayers. God doesn't love you like you say he does, or he wouldn't allow this in your life. That's demonic thinking. Don't buy into it. Not for a moment. You need that enablement, that grace, that spiritual ability, that, that supernatural strength. And that is the answer. That you can then trust God to be sovereign in his goodness and everything. A man who loved the Lord deeply was going through a very deep and discouraging trial. And his trust in God was near the breaking point. Have you ever been there? Do you know people that perhaps are there now? They're struggling to believe. Their faith is at the breaking point. One day he went for a walk with his, his young son. And the boy wanted to... to uh, uh, to climb an old apple tree. So the father, he patiently stood there below and watched his son climb the, the apple tree. And many of the limbs on that old apple tree were dead and some of them began to break under the boy's weight. And he looked at his, at his son's plight and, and he held up his arms and he said, Buddy, jump! Jump! I'll catch you! But the boy didn't jump. He just hung on for dear life. And then another branch snapped. And he said, Daddy, should I let go of everything? Yes, his dad said, and without hesitation, that little boy, he jumped and his father safely caught him. And that believer said later on, later on, that incident God used, he said, that incident was God's message directly to me. He said, God reminded me of that a little bit later on and I understood what the Lord was trying to teach me 
let go. Let go of all. And he says at that moment, he totally trusted God, and God wonderfully met him and strengthened him. Let's read the verse again. Verse 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear you not, for I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Have you memorized those verses? Is there anyone here that has memorized them that would like to give it a try? Anyone? I warned you in the bulletin to please email to please work on these verses. Look, are you serious about get, getting ahead? <laughs> are you serious about victory in your life? Serious enough to learn a couple of simple verses so that you can apply them? When you're hit, when you're knocked down? You think I give you these verses to memorize for nothing? This is what you need. This is providing the enlightenment that then leads you to take the enablement that is offered, that is provided for you. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you once again this afternoon for the opportunity that we have had to just think about the truths. All the circumstances that are allowed into our life, you are sovereignly in control of them. And because of that, you use them to carry out your purpose in us so that you can carry out your purpose through us. Remind us of that as we pass through the waters, as we pass through the fire, as we enter and go through our trials. Lord, let us see it with 50-20 vision. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Seal that now in our thinking, in our hearts, that we never forget it, that we're reminded of it in Jesus' name.